we, we met a number of years ago. Uh, in part, I was writing a movie, uh, I was going in to pitch a movie called Interstellar. Uh, at the time, Steven Spielberg was the director, and he wanted to do a grounded movie about the future of space travel. So I came in and my pitch was very short. I said the movie's gonna be 10 minutes long because it's not happening. It was about 10 years ago. Uh, we're not going. There's no money left. This is not a priority for us anymore. Uh, and then in the course of, and somehow I got the job, in the course of uh, writing the movie, working with Kip Thorne, a physicist, invited me at a physics conference one night and I got uh, seated next to Elon. We've been friends ever since. The irony of that being, I wound up becoming friends with a guy who I think personally is moving the needle back in the other direction, kind of by himself at this point, uh, more, than, more than anyone I can think of. So the net result is, I think we are going back to the moon. I think we are going to Mars. And I think a lot of it is because of you. Um, so one of the questions we've got here today. One of the questions that you guys have submitted that I, that I love is, it's simple, Mars, how can we help? <laughs> well, let's see, so, in the short term, Mars is really about getting the spaceship built. Um, we're, we're Making good progress on the on the uh, on the ship and the booster, um, codenamed BFR. Um, Wait, what does that stand for again? Well, it's a bit of a it's like sort of a Rorschach test in acronym form, um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but it is very big. <laughs> yeah. And um, I gave a presentation on this at the. Uh, International Astronautical Congress in Australia last year, um, and that design is evolving rapidly. We're actually building that uh, that, sh that that ship right now. Um, the I, I think right now that like the, the biggest thing that would be helpful is um, just general support and encouragement, um, and uh, good goodwill. Um, I think once we build it, there will be um, we'll, we'll have a, uh, a pr sort of a, a, a point of proof, something that um, other companies and countries can then go and do. Like, they currently don't think it's possible, so if we show them that it is, then I think they will they'll up their game and they will build um, interplanetary transport vehicles as well. Um, now, one, once that has been built and there is a uh, there's a means of getting cargo and people to and from Mars, as well as to and from the Moon, um, and, and other places in the solar system. And I think uh, th that's that's really where th there's a tremendous amount of uh, entrepreneurial entrepreneurial resources that are needed, because you've got to build out the entire base of industry, everything that allows hu uh, human civilization to exist. And it's going to be harder, um, a lot harder, in a place like Mars or the Moon. We're going to need some volunteers to be colonists. Do we have any colonist yeah. volunteers here from Mars? <laughs> Actually, not many hands raised, by the way. <laughs> um, I mean, the moon of Mars is often th thought of as, like, is this some escape, escape, escape hatch for rich people? But I, it, it won't be that at all. It's um, in anyone who, for, for the early people that go to, go to Mars, it'll be far more dangerous I mean, really, it's, it, it kind of reads like Shackleton's ad for Antarctic explorers. You know, it's like um, difficult, dangerous, good chance you will die. <laughs> <laughs> Excitement for those who survive. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I think there's not many people who actually want to go in the beginning because all those things I said are true. Uh, but there'll be some who, who will, for, for whom the excitement of the frontier and exploration exceeds the concern of danger. Um, and, uh, and, and they will start off building the most elementary infrastructure, just a base uh, to create propellant, uh, uh, a power station, um, 
glass domes in which to grow crops, um, all the, the sort of fundamentals um, without which we, you cannot survive. Um, and, and, then, and then really there's going to be an explosion of entrepreneurial opportunity because Mars will need everything from um, iron uh, foundries to pizza joints to nightclubs. Def definitely pizza joints. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mars should really have great bars. <laughs> um, the Mars bar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Like, I'm a, I love dad jokes, all right? <laughs> I'm dad. Um, right, what, do, what do you think the timeline for this is? So I, I, I'm feeling pretty optimistic about the timeline, although um, I'm, I can be a little, sometimes my timelines are a little, you know. Um, <laughs> people have told me <laughs> that um, my timelines historically have been uh, optimistic, and so I'm trying to recalibrate to some degree here. Um, but I can tell you what, what, what I know currently is the case is that we're, we are building the first uh, ship, the first Mars um, or, inter or interplanetary ship um, right now. And I think we'll be able, to be able to do short flights, short sort of up and down flights, um, probably sometime in the first half of next year. And this is, this is a very big um, booster and ship. The, Liftoff thrust of this would be about twice that of a Saturn V. So, it's uh, it's capable of doing um, 150 metric tons to to orbit, in and be fully reusable. Um, so the the uh, expendable payload is uh, around around double that number. So, um, what it'll what, what's amazing about this ship, assuming we can make um, full and, full and rapid reusability work is that we can reduce the cost, modular cost per flight dramatically um, by orders of magnitude compared to where it is today. Um, th this, this, this question of reusability is so fundamental to rocketry. It is the, it is the fundament fundamental breakthrough that's needed. If you consider aircraft, for example, the, uh, you can uh, lease a 747 and do a return flight uh, from full of cargo from uh, California to Australia uh, for half a million dollars. That's what it costs to lease a 747 fully uh, round trip to Australia, which is far. Um, uh, to buy a single engine turboprop plane, a good one, would, would, uh, would be about one and a half million dollars. And that can't even reach Australia, and it's, and it's tiny compared to a 747. So what that means is like a, 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 it costs less to, um, to take it to, to use a giant plane with huge cargo for a long trip, then it, then it that, that costs way less than buying a small plane for a short trip in the aircraft world. And the same actually is true of rocketry. The the the, the, the um, a BFR flight will actually cost less uh, than than our Falcon One flight did back in the day. Wow. Um, so that was about a five or six million dollar marginal cost per flight. We're confident that BFR will be less than that. Um, so th that that's profound, um, and that is what will enable the creation of a, uh, a permanent base on the moon and a city on Mars, um, and that's the equivalent of like the Union Pacific Railroad, um, or or having uh, ships that can cross cross oceans. Um, until you can get there, there's no way for all of the entrepreneurial energy to. Um, you can't, you can't do anything. There's no way for all the flowers to bloom. Um, once you can get there, the opportunity is, is immense. Yeah. Um, and um, so we're going to do our best to get you there and then make sure that there's a, an environment in which um, uh, entrepreneurs can, can flourish. Um, and, um, and, and then I think it'll be, it'll be amazing. Absolutely. A big part of that, and we've talked about this, um, is inspiring people to look again at this. You know, we were talking about this yesterday. It was our grandparents who went to the moon. And we have not gone back since. You know, in my lifetime, no one's gone to the moon. Um, you and I were having a conversation last year about what to put in Falcon Heavy. Uh, and, and the kind of, what's the cargo? Uh, and the idea was to 
to use that as an opportunity to inspire people. Again, Carl Sagan had a beautiful thought many, many years ago that if you just get enough people to look at the earth from a distance, that it would get them to focus on the problems here and on the possibilities of, of space exploration. Um, I was fortunate enough to be with you at Launch Control when Falcon Heavy uh, launched a few weeks back, and we made a, a little movie, we've called it a trailer, um, that, uh, that, that sums up that experience. We have, it, uh, we have it here, we thought we'd play it for you guys again. This is two minutes that, that does a pretty good job of giving you the feeling of what it was like uh, to be there when Falcon Heavy launched. Yeah, we really want, we wanted to get the public, you to, we wanted you to get excited about the possibility of something new happening in space, of the space frontier getting pushed forward. Um, the goal of this was to inspire you um, and make you believe again, just as people believed in the Apollo era, that anything's possible. Thank you. Um. That, that picture at the end is a picture of one of the circuit boards inside the Roadster, right? Yeah. Um, we try to confuse the aliens as much as possible. <laughs> um, there's a, if you look carefully, there's also a, a little Hot Wheels version of the Roadster with a tiny little astronaut in the Hot Wheels Roadster <laughs> on the dashboard. Um, that was uh, it's just by a, a friend of ours called uh, Nora. Um, Nora suggested that and... Uh, so, um, if you guys have any suggestions, let us know. Um. <laughs> I think for me, watching those two boosters come down side by side yeah. felt like a transformative moment. It felt like a, oh, we can do anything. And that's the culmination. I was really struck there by the culmination of, you know, a singular vision and hundreds or thousands of very talented people working together to make sure. I, I was sitting in launch control and looking at the sheer amount of variables that you guys are clocking in those moments before the launch. Wind speed at different altitudes and the status of all the different 27 engines in that, in that. I mean, how do you manage, how do you, you're very hands-on with the details, but you're also looking at the bigger, bigger picture. How do you manage your time? How do you, how do you, how do you parse, you know, how do you zoom in and zoom out and make sure that all these things are coming together? Well, at, at SpaceX, almost all my time is spent on um, engineering and design. Um, it's probably 80 and 90 percent. Um, and then uh, Gwyn Chartwell, who's president and chief operating officer, takes care of the business operations of the company, um, which is what allows me to do that. Um, and um, yeah, I think in, in order to make the right decisions, you have to understand something. And if you don't understand something at a detailed level, you cannot make a good decision. Um, so. Um, but I'd, I'd like to just point out, like the you know what you saw there is a result of an incredible team at, at SpaceX, super talented people who really work like crazy to make that happen. Um, you know, I think my role is to make sure that they have an environment where they can they can really where the talents can really come to the fore, um, and um, you know and and. and uh, but I, I can't tell you how honored and grateful I am to work with such a great team. Everyone in this room is inspired by you. Who are you inspired by? Well, Kanye West, obviously. <laughs> uh, <somebody said. laughs> Me too. Fred Astaire, Fred Astaire, which, you know, you should see my dance moves. We, we, uh, may, we may see some actually, dance moves unless... I do love Fred Astaire. He's amazing. If you haven't watched his movies, they're amazing. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, when I look at all of, all of the things you've undertaken to do, the, the commonality is with Tesla, with SpaceX, Silver City, now with the Boring Company, um, it feels like you're seeing a firmly established and mature industry that is ripe for sort of a quantum shift. That there's, a, there's an opportunity there for, you know, in the case of cars, it's electrification, which drastically changes, 
you know, the complexity of, of, of an automobile and, and potentially down the, down the line, the, the, the expense of it. Uh, with rockets, it's the reusability of it. Um, with, with solar, it's about a firmly established energy system that's about to be massively disrupted. This is happening. Um, and with the boring company, it's about looking at infrastructure projects which typically take decades and billions of dollars and looking to, to reduce the, the, the complexity of that. Is, that. is that how you, is that how you, you know, is that how you see the world? Do you see the things that don't work and can be made better? Um, no. <laughs> not, I mean, not, I, I, have, I don't sort of like look at things and say, okay, what's the rank ordered, uh, you know, business opportunity um, from a financial standpoint or, or anything like that. It, it's, uh, it's really just like, th these are the th there's some things that, are, that don't seem to be working um, that are important for the, you know, for our life and for the future to be good. Um, and I have to say that if, if, um, if, if one were to say like, where is the, if, if, you, if one were to do a risk adjusted rate of return estimate on various industry opportunities, I would put uh, errors, like basically building rockets and cars pretty close to the bottom of the list. <laughs> that they would have to be the dumbest things to do. Um, just, just because, you know, you look at the, the auto industry, um, and in the US auto industry, the only two companies that haven't gone bankrupt, um, at, at least at some point, are Tesla and Ford. Every other company got bankrupt or was failing and got acquired. Um, there's only two companies that haven't gone bankrupt, and there's a big graveyard of companies that did. So, and then going up against entrenched competitors, there's no, the, the, I, I, I gave basically both SpaceX and Tesla from the beginning um, a probability of less than 10% of likely, likely to succeed. Um, so why do it? Well, in the case of SpaceX, uh, I just kept wondering why we were not making progress towards um, sending people to Mars. Um, why we didn't have a base on the moon? Um, you know, where, where are the sort of space hotels that were promised in 2001, the movie? Uh, it's like, you know, it's uh, it just wasn't happening year after year. Uh, it, was make, it was getting me down. And I look at the NASA website. I was like, does, where does it say when we're going to Mars? It doesn't. Um, so, and initially for SpaceX, for example, I thought, well, um, I'll, the, the genesis of SpaceX was not to create a company, but, but really, how do, how do we get NASA's budget to be bigger? That was initially the goal. So um, I came up with this little small philanthropic mission, which would be to send a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars. It's called Mars Oasis. And, um, and there would, upon landing, the seeds would be in dehydrated nutrient gel, hydrated upon landing, and, and, and you'd have this little greenhouse. And then the money shot would be you know, green plants against a red background. Um, so recently learned that money shot has a meaning that uh, <laughs> that I didn't wasn't aware of, but um, <laughs> the the uh, you know I think that that would get people excited about um, re rekindle the, the spirit of Apollo essentially. And as I got more and more into what it would take to do that, I learned that the fundamental um, issue is actually the cost of access to space. Rockets were super expensive and the cost, cost per pound or kilogram to orbit had actually gone up over the years, not down. And it was like, okay, well, if, it, it, it won't matter if, if, if we are able to do this philanthropic mission and um, it generates a lot of will to go to Mars. That's not gonna matter if there's no way. Um, so um, after my second or third trip back from Russia, I was like, whoa, there's gotta be a way to build rockets um, there's got to be a way to solve the, this, this rocket problem. Um, I started reading a lot of books on rockets and did a sort of a first principles analysis of, of a rocket, just broke down the materials that are in a rocket, what would it cost to buy those materials, what versus the price of the rocket, and there's a gigantic difference between the um, raw material cost of the rocket and the finished cost of the rocket. So there must be something um, wrong happening in, in going from the constituent at atoms to the final shape. Um, and and I found that certainly to be true. And then, um, and then why weren't people trying to make reusability work? Um, 
it was very difficult to make rocket, rocket reusability work. Um, and then unfortunately the, the space shuttle ended up being a counter example of don't, of don't try to make reusability work because the space shuttle added, ended up costing more per flight than an expendable vehicle of equivalent capability. So for a long time people were using the space shuttle as an example of why reusability is dumb. Um, you can't take a single case example uh, and make an entire theory out of it. Um, so uh, there's no question in my mind that if you could reuse the rockets, if, if, um, it, has to be, it has to be true reuse, which means um, rapid and complete reuse. The problem with the space shuttle is uh, only a portion of the system came back. Like the, the big orange tank, which was also the primary airframe, was discarded every time. And the parts that were reused were incredibly difficult to refurbish. Um, so the, kind of re the only kind of re reuse that matters is if it's rapid and complete. Um, so that the only thing you're changing between flights, apart from scheduled maintenance, is the propellant. Um, so we, we embarked upon that journey to create SpaceX in 2002. Um, and uh, in the beginning, I wouldn't, actually wouldn't even let my friends invest because I didn't want to lose their money. I thought it was like, you know, I'd rather lose my own money. So, um, and then um, it, we, we almost did die at SpaceX, actually. So we, I budgeted for, for three flights. Um, I mean, technically, I, I did have a plan where I, I had, a, had, this, had the money from PayPal. I had like about 180 million from PayPal. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll allocate half of that to SpaceX and Tesla and SolarCity, and um, that should be fine. I'll have 90 million, like just lots, you know. Uh, but but then what happened is um, things cost more and took longer than than I thought. So I had a choice of either put the rest of the money in or the companies are going to die. Um, and it's like, so I, put, I ended up putting all the money in and, and borrowing money for rent from France. Um, 2008 was brutal. <laughs> um, yeah, 2008, we had the third consecutive failure of the Falcon rocket for SpaceX. Um, Tesla almost went bankrupt. We, we closed our financing round 6 p.m. Christmas Eve. 2008. It was the last hour of the last day that it was possible. We would have gone bankrupt two days after Christmas otherwise. And I got divorced. That was like rough. Man. Women has got issue there. Well, it, it, it poses a question, or maybe you just answer the question of why is no one else doing these things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's your pain threshold? Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's real high. Um, so, yeah, I mean, SpaceX is alive by the skin of its teeth, so is Tesla. Um, if, if things had just gone a little bit the other way, it, it, both companies would be dead. And, I, and I, like one of the most difficult choices I've ever faced uh, in life was, was in 2008. Um, and um, I think I had uh, like a, maybe $30 million left in, or thirty or forty million dollars left in two thousand eight. I had two choices. I could put it all into one company, and then the other company would definitely die, um, or split it between the two companies. And but if I split it between the two companies, then both might die. Um, and you know, when you put your blood, sweat, and tears into creating something, or building something, it's like a child. Um, and so it's like which one. Am I going to let one starve to death? I couldn't bring myself to do it, so I, put, I, I split the money between the two. Fortunately, thank goodness, uh, they both came through. We've got a question from the audience that builds on that. Um, what was your biggest failure, and how did it change you? What was your biggest failure, and how did it change you? Well, I have to really think hard about that. Failure. Never heard of it. <laughs> there's, there's your answer. <laughs> um, well, there's a ton of failures along the way, that's for sure. Um, like I said, for, as, as I said, for, for SpaceX, the first three launches failed. And uh, we, we, actually, we were just barely able to scrape together enough parts and, and money to do the, the fourth launch. If that fourth launch had failed, we would have been dead. So multiple failures along the way. Um, 
I, I tried very hard to, to get the right expertise in for, for SpaceX. I tried hard to, to find a great uh, chief engineer for the rocket, but it, not, the good chief engineers wouldn't join, and the bad ones, well, there was no, no point in hiring them. So I ended up being chief engineer of the rocket. Um, so if I could have found somebody better, then we would have maybe had less than three failures. Um, how, do you, think, how, do you, how do you plan a business where you know, in the rocket business, you know some of these things are going to blow up on the launch pad? How, how, do, how does the business plan work? I don't really have a business plan. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't had a business. I had a business plan way back in the Zip2 days. But, but these things are just always wrong. So I just, just didn't bother with business plans after that. Um, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think, you know, w wishful thinking for sure is a, a source of many problems in, in, in many walks of life. Um, you know, business or personal, business or personal wishful thinking causes a lot of, a lot of trouble. Um, you really have to ask, it, you know, whether something is true or not. Um, that doesn't make sense. And if it ever feels like too easy, it probably is. Um, you know, the, um, yeah. Um, but for all the drama of, of SpaceX, I think Tesla's actually been, been probably two-thirds of my total, total drama dose over, over time. Tesla's a drama magnet. It's crazy. Um, How do you, I mean, a lot of people want to know, you know, you're managing three or four companies now, each of them trying to do something revolutionary, each of them challenging a business that has historically been regarded as <clears throat> impossible to challenge or disrupt. How do you, how do you prioritize? How do you, how do you, how do you prioritize between the, the different companies? How do you prioritize? How do you spend your time? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, can I trouble you for a water? It's the, I've got a bit of a cold, so my voice is a bit hoarse. Um, um, to, in terms of time priority, um, um, for, for business time, almost all of it is really dedicated to SpaceX and Tesla. It may sound like I've got a lot of different endeavors, but it, it's overwhelmingly SpaceX and Tesla in terms of time allocation. Um, so it's, uh, and, and then for non-business stuff, it's almost entirely kids stuff. My kids are here, here today, actually. I brought them along to South by Southwest. I um, hope they're having a good time. <laughs> um, they, they went and saw the, the Westworld uh, exhibit. or it's, it's really amazing. If you haven't seen the Westworld, um, what do you call it, exhibit or a... Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you call it. I think you just call it <laughs> it's, Westworld it's a, at this point. Uh, theme park. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really incredibly well done. Uh, I took the kids there yesterday. They had a great time. Um, but yeah, the, um, I think probably one of the, the, the biggest misunderstandings is that I'm, I'm actually not an investor. Um, sometimes people think I'm an investor or I invest in things. I don't actually don't invest in anything. In fact, the only uh, public security that I own of any kind is Tesla. Um, and then the, the next biggest is, is SpaceX. And, um, and then uh, the Boring Company kind of started it more as a joke, because that would be a funny name for a company. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, we put, uh, we put the zero in bring. I mean, it's sort of like, um, <laughs> that makes any, doesn't make any sense. Um. <laughs> but when we, when we, when we talk, I remember when you first told me that you were thinking about tunnels. Yeah, when, when did I first tell you about that? Years ago. Okay, it's like a long time ago. Yeah, like, I, I thought you were joking. Yeah, yeah that, it was. I was joking, but... The, <laughs> Um, it's, it's not because of some epiphany that I had one day um, driving down the 405. Um, that's how it gets translated somehow. I was talking about tunnels for years and years. Um, for probably five years or four years at least, whenever I'd give a talk and people would ask me about what opportunities do you, do you see in the world, I'd say tunnels. Can someone please build tunnels? 
So after four or five years of begging people to build tunnels, <laughs> and still no tunnels, I was like, okay, I want to build a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> so like maybe, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, so um, yeah, so I was like basically talking people's ears off of tunnels for, for several years, and then said, well, let's find out what it takes to build a tunnel. And um, yeah, so, so I started digging a tunnel. I wanted to start the tunnel uh, from where I could see it from my office at SpaceX. So I, start, I said, well, let's just carve off a part of the parking lot across the road so I can see if, it's, if anything's happening or not. <laughs> um, and then we named our first boring machine uh, Godot because <laughs> I kept waiting for it. It never came. <laughs> um, finally it did. Um, and, and we got it going. And um, now we're making good progress. Um, and uh, we, we're finding the company for merchandise sales. Um, so uh, thank you for anyone who's bought our flamethrower. Um, <laughs> you will not be sorry, or maybe you will. <laughs> it won't be boring. <laughs> we, we have a video, I think, uh, here of the latest vision for the boring company in terms of how it plan you know, the, the oh, hopes cool. of the I, didn't, I even didn't even know this. Great. <laughs> Added seats. You know, when we were first talking about the concept, you know, tunnels feel like a resolutely old school uh, solution I, to a problem. I'm that, that I invented tunnels. <laughs> um. <laughs> and I was still holding out hope for the flying car, and then you asked me one simple question that answered the question for me about flying cars kind of forever, which was, would you want your neighbor to have a flying car? Yes, exactly. This is exactly the question. Oh, you want a flying car? How about everyone around you has a flying car too? Oh. <laughs> That doesn't sound so good. Um, yeah. And I, I think one of the interesting things about tunneling is it's, it's one of these things that, you know, there's not a lot of market competition there. It's not a, you know, it's, it's something that's ripe for change. So how do you, yeah, I, I remember you talked about the philosophy with Godot was to just keep running it basically until you figured out mm -hmm. why it can't run any faster. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, I mean, the, the boring company, to be clear, it, it, it's, uh, it's like literally 2% of my time. It, it's probably 20% of my tweets. <laughs> but tweets do not correlate to actual time spent. Um, it, it, the, I mean, I sort of just have fun with the boring company, um, but my time allocation is, is about, it's literally about 2%. Um, Talk about your time allocation. I think one of the things you spend an awful lot of time uh, thinking about, I know, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence. It's something that you and I have as a, a shared interest, and it's something that our audience is interested in as well. Um, the question here is a lot of experts in AI don't share the same level of concern that you do about the dangers huh. of AI. Fools. What, what Famous specific, last words. What, speci what specifically do you believe that they don't? <sighs> um, well, the biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. Um, in general, we are all much smarter than we think we are. But much less smart, dumber than we think we are. Um, by a lot. So, <laughs> this, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. Um, they just can't, they, they define themselves by their intelligence and they they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. Um, I'm really quite close to, I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI, and 
it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows. And the rate of improvement is exponential. Um, and you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole, 4-5, um, who had been world champion for many years, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was Alpha Zero, uh, which crushed Alpha Go 100 to zero. <laughs> and Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, it, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman for any game. Um, nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those, so, the, those same experts uh, who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions for things like Go and, and other, and, and other uh, AI advancements have, uh, their, their batting average is quite weak. It's not good. Um, the, the, we'll see this also with, uh, with self-driving. Uh, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be, will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200% um, safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking like maybe 18 months from now. Um, uh, NHTSA did a study on, on Tesla's autopilot version one, which is relatively primitive, and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. And that's despite autopilot one being just version one. Um, version two, I think, will be at least two or three times better. That's the current version that's running right now. Um, so the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face, and the, and the most pressing one. And how do we do that? I mean, if, if we take it that it's inevitable at this point, that some version of AI is coming down the line, how do we, how do we steer through that? Well, I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight I mean, I think one should generally err on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads, by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. Well, it's a question you've been asking for a long time, but I think it's a question that's come to the forefront over the last year, where you begin to realize that it doesn't necessarily, I think if we've, we've all been focused in on the idea of artificial superintelligence, right? Which is clearly a danger, but maybe, you know, a little further out. Um, what's happened over the last year is you've seen artificial, what I've been calling artificial stupidity. You've been talking about, you know, algorithmic manipulation of social media, like we're, we're in it now. It's starting, it's starting to happen. How do we, how do we, is it, What's the intervention at this point? Um, to be honest, I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff. The things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation, uh, in lost jobs, and um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, 
very, very carefully. Um, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. Yeah. Uh, building on that, other, other than AI and the, the other issues that you're, that you're tackling, transportation, energy production, aerospace, what issues should our next generation of leaders be focused on solving? What else is coming down the line? Um, well, I mean, there, there are other things that are on a longer time scale. The, it, um, and obviously the things that I believe in, like extending life beyond Earth, making life multiplanetary. Um, and I'm a big believer in sort of um, Asimov's Foundation series, or the principle that you, you really want to, um, you know, I recommend reading the Foundation series, but it's like, if, if, you, if you know that there's, a, there's likely to be, we don't know, but there's likely to be another Dark Ages, which it seems, my guess is there probably will be at some point. Um, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that we're about to enter Dark Ages, but that there's some probability that we will, particularly if there's a Third World War. Um, then we want to make sure that there's enough of a, of a seed of human civilization somewhere else uh, to bring civilization back um, and perhaps uh, shorten the length of the Dark Ages. Um, you know, I think that's why it's, imp that it's important to get a self-sustaining base, um, ideally on Mars, because Mars is far enough away from Earth that... A, that um, a war on Earth, the Mars base might survive. It's more likely to survive than a moon base. But I think a moon base and a Mars base um, that, um, that could perhaps help regenerate life back here on Earth would be really important and uh, to get that done before a possible World War III. Um, you know, last, last century we had two massive world wars, three if you count the Cold War. I think it's unlikely that we will never have another world war again. Um, there probably will be at some point. Or if we have another one, it'll be the last. Yeah, it, it, it just could be radioactive rubble. You know? um, so, again, I'm not predicting. <laughs> it just seems like, well, if you say given enough time, will it be most likely given enough time? This, this, is, this is, has been our pattern in the past. Uh, so, um, like I really believe in the zeroth law of Asimov's zeroth law. You know, take the set of actions most likely to support um, humanity into the future. Um, but I think that sustainable energy is also obviously really important. That's tautological. If it's not sustainable, it's unsustainable. Yeah, how close are we to solving that problem? Well, I think that the core technologies are, are there with the wind, solar, um, with, with batteries. Um, the but the fundamental problem is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of, of, of CO2. Um, the, the market economics works very well if things are priced correctly. But when, there's, when things are not priced correctly, um, and something that has, has a real cost has zero cost, then that's where you get distortions in the market that inhibit the progress of, of other technologies. So, um, essentially, anything that that produces carbon, it will push, push carbon into the atmosphere, which includes rockets, by the way. So I'm not excluding rockets from this. Um, there has to be a price, and that um, you can start off with a low price, uh, but then that price, and, and then depending upon whether that price has any effect on the parts per million, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, you can adjust that price up or down. Uh, but in the absence of a price. We sort of pretend that digging trillions of tons of of, of uh, fossil fuels from deep un under the earth and putting it into the atmosphere, we're pretending that that, ha that 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 has no probability of a bad outcome. And the entire scientific community is saying, obviously, it has it, it's going to have a bad outcome. Obviously, <laughs> you just you're changing the chemical constituency of the atmosphere. So. Um, so it's really up to people and, and governments to put to put a price on on carbon and and then automatically the right thing happens. It's it's really straightforward. Um, 
what do we do with the carbon that's already up there? I actually think we can manage with the current carbon level, or even a little bit higher. Um, it, it, it's, um, and this is going to sound um, sound like I'm backtracking, but there's actually an argument that m more carbon in the atmosphere is is actually good, but up to a point. So <laughs> we, we might actually arguably have been a little carbon starved. If you go back 200 years ago um, and say, okay, a few hundred years ago, we're like, we had like 280, 290 parts per million of carbon. We're probably a little carbon starved. Now we're about 400, just past the 400 mark. I think somewhere in the 400s, probably okay. Uh, we don't have to worry about sequestering carbon or anything like that. But now, if this momentum keeps going and we start going up to 600, 800, 1,000, 1,500, um, that's where things get really squirrely. Um, and uh, the, the sheer momentum of the world's energy infrastructure is leading us in that direction. Um, it's very, so it's just very important that the, the public and the government's push to, to ensure that the, the correct price of carbon is paid. Um, so that, that will be the thing that, that, that matters. Um, yeah. Our audience is very interested in knowing how many hours of sleep you got last night. Uh, I don't know, about six, uh, five or six, I think. Five? I, don't know. I feel like we know part of the answer to this because you were trapped in Westworld for a while. Um, uh, but, but how, I mean, on a, re a regular day for you, are you, are you, are you sleeping? You're not sleeping a lot, right? Well, oh, geez, do I look that bad? <laughs> no. Um, you look great. Oh, but thanks. we just imagine with the amount of responsibilities, with the amount of, you know, with, with what you've got going on, do these problems still keep you up at night or do you think we're on our way to solving them? Well, right now, the only things that are really stressing me out in a big way are AI, obviously. Um, that's like always there. And, uh, and uh, I'm working really hard on Tesla Model 3 production. Um, and uh, we're making good progress, but it's hugely hard work. But those are the two most stressful things in my life right now. Yeah. Um, our audience really wants to know, uh, what do you hope the world will look like for children born today when they're your age? When, sorry? What, what do you hope for the world to look like? What's the best case scenario? Say we solve these problems. What's that world look like? Well, let's see. So, I think the, a good future would look like, you know, we, we really substantially transferred to sustainable generation and consumption of electricity um, so that the, the, the CO2 risk and the ocean rising risk is mitigated. Um, and we're not looking at like, you know, having Florida and, and sort of large portions of the world underwater. <laughs> That'd be great <laughs> to, to not, um, not to have addressed that risk. That'd be, that'd be enormous. Um, for us to have a base on the moon, base on Mars, to be out there exploring the solar system, start building industry on, essentially having human civilization go out there and, 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 and have it be such that anyone can go uh, to the moon or Mars or out to the solar system if they want, to make it really affordable. Um, I do think it's important that there's competition, that there are multiple companies doing this, not just SpaceX. Um, and. Um, and that AI risk is, that I guess it's the sort of a benign AI and that we're able to achieve a symbiosis with that AI. Um, ideally the AI, uh, there's somebody who, I can't remember his name, but had a good suggestion for what the um, optimization of the AI should be, what's its utility function. Um, you have to be careful about this because if you say maximize happiness, and the AI concludes that happiness is a function of dopamine and, and serotonin. So it captures all humans and injects your brain with large amounts of dopamine and serotonin. <laughs> like, okay, it's not what we meant. <laughs> it sounds pretty good, though. <laughs> oh, you'll love it. <laughs> um, well, I like the definition of, like, the AI should try to maximize the freedom of action of, of humanity. Um, so maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. Um, 
I like that definition. Um, but we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and uh, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between, um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and, your, and human brain. Um, yeah, we're already, we're already a, a cyborg in the sense that, uh, that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. Um, just low bandwidth input output. Right? Exactly, it's just low bandwidth, um, particularly output. I mean, two thumbs, basically. Um, so how do we solve that problem? The, the, band, the bandwidth thing? The bandwidth issue. <laughs> I mean, we've all, we've all succumbed to it now. We're, we're, all, we're all cyborgs. We're just low-efficiency cyborgs. So how do, we, how do we make it better? I think we've got to build, a, we've got to build an interface. Um, like, we didn't evolve to have a communications jack. Um, you know, or, or some... So there's got to be essentially vast numbers of, of, of tiny electrodes uh, it, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know, security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. Um, I was gonna say, I'm not coming with, I'm keeping my brain air gapped. Yeah, well I think a lot of people will choose to do that. Um, but um, it's a bit like Ian Banks' neural lace, mm -hmm. but, not, but in, in the case of neural lace, it's sort of, that, that's there from when you're born, or it, it's sort of, it's not a, it's, it's more a of a, backup. Sorry? It's a backup. Yeah, kind of a backup. Um, this would be, there's, there's a digital extension of you uh, that is an AI, the AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. Um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you, and that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, I hope so. If anybody's got better ideas, I'd love to hear it. Um, and, um, and talk about another project that you're working on that our audience wants to know a little bit more about, Starlink. Oh. Can um, you tell us anything? Um, do, do you mean Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not Skynet. It's internet in the sky. Um, <laughs> um, well, we... Um, we don't talk that much about Starlink, but essentially it's intended to provide low latency, high bandwidth internet connectivity throughout the world. Um, that, there actually will not be enough cognitive processing power on board the satellite system to, to uh, in any way be a Skynet thing. Like it's the <laughs> um, digital AI requires a lot of, super intelligence requires a lot of big servers on the ground, it's too power intensive. Uh, but this is intended to be to provide people with, um, who don't have any internet connectivity with internet connectivity. Um, and it's very good for sparse and sparsely populated and moder moderately sparsely populated areas and for giving people in cities uh, um, a choice of, a, a, you know, low cost choice of, of internet access. But I do think it's going to be important, the stalling system will be important in providing the funding necessary for SpaceX to develop um, interplanetary spacecraft. Um, and at the same time, yeah, helping people who have either no or super extensive connectivity and giving people in urban areas more of a competitive choice. Very cool. Um, I have to ask you because it's the number one question. Uh, just going back to Mars, uh, what kind of government do you envision for the first Martian colony? <laughs> um, so we're and, and, what's your, and what's your title? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> emperor or God Emperor? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it might be too much. I don't know. Um, if, if you have to watch my jokes here. Not everyone gets irony. You know. <laughs> must remember. Must remember. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, the I think most likely the the form of government on Mars would be somewhat of a direct democracy, where. Um, you vote on issues, where, where people vote directly on issues, instead of going through representative government. In, in, you know, when the United States was formed, 
representative government was the only thing that was logistically feasible because peop there's no way, it was no way for people to communicate instantly. Um, a lot of people didn't even have really access to uh, mailboxes or there wasn't even really, a, the post office was very, very primitive. A lot of people couldn't write. Um, so you had to have some form of representative democracy uh, or things just wouldn't work at all. Um, but I think on Mars, most likely it's gonna be people, everyone votes on every issue and that's how it goes. Uh, there are a few things I'd recommend which is keep laws short. Um, long laws, it's like that's, that's something suspicious is going on if there's long law. <laughs> you know, if, if, you're, if the size of the law exceeds the word count of Lord of the Rings, something's, <laughs> 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 which it does, amazingly, then it's like something's wrong. Um, so there should be a limit to the size of the law that it, you should be able to digest it. Like, how come you can read the Constitution and all of the amendments, like you can read those in maybe an hour. And, and, and we, we govern so much of our civilization by that, and yet modern law is this ob obtuse, super boring tome that's indecipherable to almost anyone. So I think um, direct democracy, laws, laws that are comprehensible. Um, I think having some kind of hysteresis on like it should be easier to remove a law than create one because things just get to inertia. You have to have something that's gonna overcome inertia. So probably, I don't know what the right number would be, maybe it's like 60, 40, maybe it requires 60% to get a law in place, but any number above 40% can remove a law. Um, otherwise, you just get laws just accumulate over time, accumulate over time, and it, it, it's sort of like Gulliver, where you just get trapped by all these tiny strings and you can't move. Um, you get hardening of the arteries of civilization with, law, with rules and rules and rules and rules. Um, so it should be just easier to get rid of a rule than, than to put one in. Um, maybe they should even have like a, some kind of sunset clause so that they just automatically expire unless there's enough of an impetus to, to keep them around. Um, I, know, I know there's a fair amount of interest. I'm interested in he hearing a little bit more about the very early days with Tesla and how it came together. Uh, your yeah. brother Kimball is here. I thought we'd bring him out. Sure. You guys could talk a little bit about it. Uh, there. <laughs> you guys might get lucky tonight. <laughs> I notice you have a guitar. I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> we've got hats, we've got a guitar. But okay. I, I would guess there are a fair number of entrepreneurs here today and a fair number of people interested looking at Tesla, which now extraordinary, extraordinary success of it. Um, you know, how, how, did, how did this come together? I mean, when, you, and when you guys were looking at, I know famously, you know, when you guys were, you were looking at problems you could solve. How did that, what do those conversations look like? Yeah, so the, uh, let's see, so I mean, I'm talking to uh, Kimball, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, about the things that I thought would be most important to work on for a long time, all the way back to college days. Um, and um, electric cars are something I've been interested in since I was, like, I don't know, 18, 19. Um, when do you first recall hearing me talk about electric cars? I'm just curious. First time was, well, you, you talked about it in the 90s a lot. Uh, we, 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 we used to brainstorm a lot randomly, even in. I think we were 20, 20 years old, and the first thing I remember us brainstorming was solving connectivity amongst doctors. Huh. And we were on a road trip from. That was Silicon. hopeless. Huh? <laughs> a long time ago, we had a lot of doctors in the family, so we had the information. But the idea was really to solve that problem where we, from Silicon Valley to Philadelphia, brainstorming how you do it. This is before the internet, so we, we you know, in our minds, designing network computers, doctors talking. This has all happened, of course, over 25 years, but it's one of, the, it's one of the, it's that's sort of the first time I remember us really trying to solve a world problem, and unless it was a world problem that was really important, it just wasn't that interesting to us. Electric cars, uh, you talked about for a long time, but um, I remember walking into your house once, this is in probably 2002 or 2003, and you had these plans laid out that uh, the team at Tesla had, or the, the earlier guys had, had basically said, you know, we're going to take this Lotus lease, we're going to convert it into an electric car. And you know, we sat down and talked about it for a bit, and, and it wasn't so much that it, um, 
it could be done. I think we all believe it could be done. It was more just the attitude that it should be done. And then it went from there. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the first internships that I had that were um, interesting were on ultracapacitors for use in electric cars. So that's what, why I first came out to Silicon Valley in like 93 or 92 or something like that, was to work at a company called Pinnacle Research on advanced ultracapacitors with the idea that this could be a solution to the energy storage problem in electric vehicles. And then um, when I graduated from Penn, the, I was going to be doing a PhD at Stanford um, in material science and, and, uh, and, and physics. Um, trying to figure out if there's a, a way to, to, to solve for a, an ultra high density uh, solid state capacitor um, that would have enough range to uh, power an electric vehicle. So, um, so in fact, so I, that's, that's, a, that's a 95. And then, I wasn't sure, this is one of those things where you could work in it for a long time and discover that there's no, actually no good solution. You, um, you could publish a paper and you um, get a PhD and all that, but it would be academic in its value. So in 95, I had a choice of either work on this energy storage system for electric vehicles or uh, try to play a role in building the internet. Um, but the internet stuff was happening right then and there. Um, Whereas the electric, electric vehicle technology was going to progress slowly on its own, um, whether I was there or not. So I thought, well, I'll put the grad studies on hold and do something um, to help build the internet or do something useful on the internet. Um, and that's um, when I talked to Kimball. And um, you were working in Canada at the time. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, I said, hey, why don't we try to do this, this company in Silicon Valley? Um, it's pretty cool. We built the we we were, we we were the first to see maps in door to door direction. It had been built by a company, Naptech, but never been, never been on the internet, and it was it was so cool to be the first two humans to see it. You can draw a map, type in an address, yeah. get directions. Things you probably all did about 50 times today each, um, and we were the first to see that and put it on the internet. So it was really cool. Yeah, it was a, it was the first maps and directions, yellow pages and white pages on the internet. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then we ended up helping bring a lot of publications online. So we're, as investors and customers, the New York Times Company, Knight Ritter, Hearst, and a number of others. Um, and um, yeah, but I always wanted to get back to electric vehicles because that, that was a primary interest of mine um, from undergrad and grad days. And, um, and so uh, after Zip2, Still did one more internet company because I thought Zip2 had not achieved its its full potential. Um, we, we built this incredible technology, but it wasn't being used by the customers in the right way. Um, it was a bit like building, you know, um, F-22 fighter jets, and then and then you sell them to people and they roll them down the hill at each other. And you're like, <laughs> that's really not the way to use it. Okay. Um, and I think that, that's where I decided you really want to go to the end consumer. If you've got great technology, you want to go all the way to the end consumer. Uh, don't tell it to, to, to some bonehead legacy company that doesn't understand how to use it. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, so, with, with X.com, which uh, became PayPal, uh, that's where, that, that's where we, we try to do something significant with the, with the internet. Um, and, and it got sort of part of the way towards its, its objective. Um, after PayPal um, uh, went, went public and, and then it got bought by eBay in 2002, uh, that actually freed up uh, me and a bun bunch of other people to go and create companies. And I started debating between either solar, electric car, or space. Um, I thought space was like the least likely to have somebody, the least likely to attract um, entrepreneurial talent. I thought like, like nobody is going to be crazy enough to do space, so I better do space. Um, so I started off with, with space first. Um, and, um, 
And then about a year and a half later, in 2003, uh, I had lunch with uh, J.V. Straubel and Harold Rosen. And um, it was at uh, this like, fish restaurant in El Segundo. Um, and Harold Rosen uh, had been involved in space and electric vehicles. Um, and, um, and J.V. Was, had just, gotten, just graduated from college and was working with him. And the conversation turned to electric vehicles. Um, because uh, Harold had done something called Rosen Motors, which was an, like an attempted EV startup. And I said, well, I've always been super interested in electric vehicles. I was going to do my PhD on um, in advanced energy, energy storage. <coughs> Sorry. I was going to do grad studies on, on advanced energy storage techniques for electric vehicles. And, um, and so JV said, well, have you heard of this company called AC Propulsion? because uh, they had created um, it, the T0 electric sports car as a prototype. Um, and I was like, wow, that's great. Uh, like lithium ion batteries had really achieved a level of energy density that could, um, for the first time could allow you to have significant range in an electric car. Um, and they had a, a sports car that had zero to 60 in under four seconds, a 250 mile range. Um, and it was pretty cool. Now it was just made of a, it was just a kit car, so it didn't have a roof or airbags or a thermal control system, and it was extremely unreliable. It, it wasn't productized, but it was a proof of concept. Um, so I got the test drive from AC Propulsion, and I was like, "Wow, you guys should really commercialize this. This would show people what electric cars can do." And I tried for months to get AC Propulsion to um, go into production with the T0. And like they just were not interested in doing that. Um, amazingly, they wanted to do an electric Scion. Um, you know, like that boxy car? Um, but th the problem is like the electric Scion would, co would cost $70,000. Um, or you could build a sports car for $100,000. Okay, but like nobody's gonna buy the electric Scion. Um, but people might buy the electric sports car. Um, so uh, after Hounding them for, for, for months, um, I finally said, like, look, if you guys are not going to commercialize the T0, would you mind if, if I did that? Um, they said, no, no, pro no problem, go ahead. It's like, great, so I'm going to do that with JV. And they said, but if you're, they said, if you're going to uh, um, if you're gonna go and try to productize the T0, there's some other teams you should talk to that are also interested in doing that. Um, so that's where um, Mark Neverhart, Mark Topping, and Ian Wright came in. Um, and, uh, and that, I think that was probably the biggest mistake in my career, quite frankly. Um, I, the, I, I think whenever you think you can have your cake and eat it too, um, that's something you're, you're probably wrong. Um, so I thought I can keep running SpaceX, I'll dedicate 20% of my time to Tesla, and that'll be fine. Um, but actually, uh, it, it didn't. Um, things really melted down. Went through hell. We had to recapitalize the company. And Kim was there, seeing it in real time. Um, so Silicon Valley, accurate or not accurate? The, the show? <laughs> yeah. Um, the it, it starts to get very accurate around ep, around episode four. <laughs> so it took a few episodes to kind of get get grounded. The first few episodes struck me as Hollywood making fun of Hollywood's idea of Silicon Valley, which is like not, you know, not on point. But then by about the, about the fourth or fifth episode, season one, it really starts to get good. And then by season two, it's amazing. Um, in fact, reality, the, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. All the crazy stuff you see in that show, Silicon Valley, the reality is way crazier than that. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it too, right? Yeah, it's like, wow. <laughs> what will have to be a story for another time, unfortunately, is we've, we've been asked to wrap it up. I've got one last question from the audience. It is, what is your favorite song from the movie Three Amigos? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we'd, only, we'd only do it if, if you guys are willing to sing along. OK. All right. So, so Jonah actually is the dancer of the three. <laughs> Um, he, he, the the three of us have been, we've been playing and singing and dancing this song since we were kids. And so we're going to do that on stage, and uh, if you guys can sing along. We'll, we'll do the first verse, and then you guys can sing along on the second verse. 
Okay. This is going to be real bad. We promised that it would be terrible. Yeah, exactly. I said terrible. It's going to be terrible. I, I'm nixing the dancing thing. Oh, come on. You stay a while. Won't you stay a while? <laughs> Moonbeams meet the sky, and you and I will walk the by on by on by. Well, this is really winning. <laughs> <laughs> 